Welcome, everybody. Yes, welcome to Tonko Cast 25. 25, and today Ooh. we interview Jinko Goto. Yes, it was a huge honor. Meg and I got to interview this incredible woman. Um, Jinko has been a really amazing friend to the studio over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, just a little bit of background on Jinko is she's worked on a number of animated films over the years, starting with um, some of the hybrid films where you saw in Space Jam's animation along with live action, and recently has produced the sequel to uh, the Lego movie, as well as executive producing Klaus, which will be released in 2019. Yes, and then on top of all of that, She's also the Vice President of Women in Animation. And Women in Animation has started an initiative that Tonko House is now taking part of. So please enjoy our conversation with Jinko. Thrilled to be invited, so thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no, we're excited to talk to you. I feel like this is uh, a topic that uh, is near and dear to um, a lot of us here at Tonko House and you know something that I think Courtney and I uh, talk about quite a bit and reflect on um, mm -hmm. and, and in hopes to you know as we have been incorporated thanks to Dyson Robert and Zen into kind of having a greater impact on um, or influence on the culture here at Tonko House. That's fantastic. That's so fantastic yeah to see um I think what, what the guys are doing is fantastic creatively, but I'm glad that they're doing that also on the, the people level, you know, yeah. of really trying to represent diversity, trying to represent both genders. So I'm thrilled. Yeah. And I think Megan and I have um, a great opportunity being in the position that we are at the studio and the age of the studio to, you know, shape it in a way that we hope is for the better for everybody. Yeah, absolutely, because you have to look, you know, if you look at 2025, I mean, this was back in 2015 when we announced 50-50 um, by 2025 initiative. Mm -hmm. You know, we were really looking at saying, where are we today um, as an industry where we saw that over 65% of the school attendees were gals studying animation, which was a big shift from like 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. but we're not seeing that in the workforce. And so we said, you know, what's the disconnect? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we don't have all the answers. In fact, I mean, I think, you know, I think we're just starting to really understand what some of those issues are. And what's really exciting is that uh, USC is now doing a study for us. Oh, and, and hopefully come next uh, 2019 Q2, we will have, um, you know, the results from the study, which we'll obviously share with everyone, that will help us hopefully understand what happens. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, but what's also exciting about 2025 is if you just look at America, where we stand as population, 75% of the workforce are going to be millennials and next gen. Mm -hmm. And minorities are going to become the majorities in terms of racially. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether we want this or don't want this, that's what's gonna happen in this <laughs> yeah. population. Yeah. So when, you know, when white guys come to me and say, hey, you know, 50-50 by 2025, I get it, I hear it, but you're telling us that we're gonna lose jobs? And I said, you guys, you can't look at it that way. Because I said, when you look at the population come 2025, you know what, the white dudes are going to be the minority. And so you guys have to embrace this and, 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 and make sure that the next generation succeed, you know? Yes. So, so that 2025 is only, you know, seven years away. It's going to happen so fast. Um, for our listeners, can you talk a little more about this 50-50 by 2025? 50-50 by 25 is a women in animation initiative. And we announced that at Annecy in 2015. You know, Annecy being the premier animation film festival that really brings the best of animation from all around the world. And we made this initiative because we saw that over 65% of the girls 
are studying animation or students studying animation are girls. Mm -hmm. But the workforce was at that point like 20%. Oh my God. So you're going like, okay, well, if all these girls are studying animation, why aren't they not in the workplace? Yeah. So that was the beginning of 2015. And like I said, you know, there are definitely internal external issues. We certainly don't understand all these issues. But, you know, if you look at the feature animation world, it's mostly white men, mm -hmm. especially if you get into creative roles. You know, girls are mostly in the production management roles. Um, if you look at back at the traditional animated features, a lot of girls were in departments um, that were less artistic, meaning they were in cleanup, they were in in-between, they were in, in campaign, they were in scanning. Mm -hmm. No, they were not animators. Mm -hmm. Certainly not. Back in the days when Disney started, there were no female animators. Mm -hmm. so, it, so the initiative is important because if we want to tell diverse stories you know you need people of diversity to be the creators behind those stories whether it's by gender or by race so um that was really you know the beginning of our initiative saying okay a lot of girls are out there studying animation we want them to get them in the workforce and have creative roles yeah you know. um so, Jinko-san, can you tell us sure. a little bit about your background and, um, yeah, just your career? It's been quite a career. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear your personal stories. Sure. So, you know, I was born in Japan. Mm -hmm. And the very first film I saw that I recall was Lady and the Tramp. My, at, at that point, my dad had been already... Um, been coming to the US and um, my parents were talking about immigrating to the US. And I was, I think about five at the time or six at the time. And so when I saw Lady and Trump, I was like, first of all, it was like, oh my God, I love dogs. <laughs> and they're talking dogs and they live in America and they have this, this idyllic life, one dog and the other dog is a street dog. And I was just, just I think because of the fact that my dad was already here in the U.S. and we we're talking about immigrating to the U.S. and to see this visual medium that I so connected with, I was profoundly impacted by the film, and I was like, and also it's magical, you know, it's not reality, right? So things that are happening in your life, that are reality, you're seeing it on a visual form that is magical. So I was really smitten by the movie and it had a huge impact on what, what I thought America was about and, and, and just the notion of this film, of this visual medium. And then I think about another six months later, maybe a year later, um, I met um, Osamu Tezukawa who created Astro Boy. And so my dad got to know him through someone and he, uh, my dad took my mom, my, my younger sister, and I have an older cousin that um, grew up with us, and she was like six years older than us. And so we went to meet um, Tezugal um at his studio. And we went up the, um, these wooden steps back of his house, and we ended up in his little studio. And he had all these background paintings and cells from Astro Boy. And, and I was like, oh my God, here's someone actually doing this, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I recall seeing, you know, earlier laying in the tramp and now here's a man that's actually doing this and he's in Japan making Astro Boy, this TV series that I'm just enthralled with. Mm -hmm. So he um, gave me a background painting and um, a cell and we left there and I said to my dad, this is what I want to do when I grow up. And so then my dad gives me this big lecture how Tezuka-san was actually a medical doctor and, you know, 
um, he had a real profession, and this this is something he started to do much later in life. He had a real profession, <laughs> right? So, so he was trying to tell me that's not a real job. You know, you have to get a real job. So, but I was still like smitten by this, and um, and you know, that I think those two things had such a huge impact on me as a child that it was like, wouldn't it be great to do this? We end up in the States and I watched movies growing up a lot. And, um, you know, I just loved movies. But, you know, back in your mind, your dad is like going, no, you can't be doing that. You have to be a doctor. You have to be a lawyer. You have to be a university professor. I mean, all of these things are professions that I think he felt was safe, you know. And especially, you know, being immigrants, I think, you know, parents are really, you know, they, they really want their children to do better than what they have, right? Yeah. So, you know, as much as I love movies, as much as I love all this, um, we're not programmed to do what we want to do, but programmed to do what your parents want you to do. So I ended up going to um, engineering school. And then I ran the phone club. So it was like, okay, I'm going to engineering school, but I'm running the, you know, the phone club. <laughs> and... <laughs> And, you know, my, all my friends are, you know, wanting to do film and, and et cetera. When I was in junior in college, um, there was a class that was given by a civil engineering class. And it was called computer graphics. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that's about. That was the days, really the beginning days of um, where they use computers to do work in civil engineering and medical fields, et cetera. You know, people weren't animating back then. They were just using computer to do simulations that you could visualize. So I took this course and I was like, oh my God, we can make computers draw or we can make computers, you know, do visualization. And it dawned on me, it was like, oh, so if I study this, I could actually have, you know, something that I want that will satisfy my parents, you know, that there's actually a job in this. And and it would get close to what I really want to do, which was make movies. So I took the class and it was a really boring class. And, but I was, you know, the notion of, okay, you can program computers to do this. So I asked the, um, the professor who was teaching the class and um, I said, well, is there anybody at the university doing this outside from this class? And he said, yeah, there's a guy up at the medical school and um, he, you know, you should look him up if this is what you want to do. So I got his name and I called him up and his name was Professor Luke Katz. And he was up at the medical school in the Department of Pharmacology. And he had come from um, MIT through Berkeley, I think. And um, he was now at Columbia Medical School at the Pharmacology Department. And he had gotten a grant from NIH and um, he was doing simulation of the interaction of DNA and carcinogens. So I called up Professor Cass and I said, my name's Jinko, I'm at the engineering school and, and I really wanna you know, do more of this work. And he said, well, um, why don't you come over? And so I got to know him and his family and he said, you know, I'm gonna be needing a programmer in my department. You should you know, apply for this job and we'll get you this job. I ended up working for him after I graduated. And um, he said, you know, now you're a staff member at Columbia. You know, if you want to go to graduate school, you should take advantage of it. It's free tuition. I was like, great. I can go to film school there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. my parents were like, you know, they were like, okay, you're at the medical school. You have a degree. You don't want to go get a PhD. Um, and you want to go to film school, but we don't have to pay your tuition. So they kind of gave in, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at that point. At that point. And um, the professor of uh, engineering school was, he was like, you know, Professor Chu was like, where are you going to grad school? I said, well, you know, in Dodge Hole. And he said, you mean, what do you mean Dodge Hole? I said, you know, the, that little building, you know, as you're walking, coming into the campus. And he says, well, what's in that building? I said, well, it's a school of fine arts. And he said, huh? <laughs> I said, well, you know, there's film, there's theater, there's, you know, fine arts. And I said, I'm going to film school. And he was like completely baffled, you know. Yeah. 
because there were three of us in the graduating class from applied math and physics and one guy was going to Caltech and the other one was going to NYU, you know, for grad school. And here I was going to film school. <laughs> but it was really, I mean, for me, it was just like, you know, here I was, you know, at the age of 22 going, I got everything I wanted, you know, having seen, you know, Lady and Travis a kid and, and coming to the U.S. and, um, you know, the parents telling you, you know, you got to do something that, you know, you can make a living. And I was like, okay, well, I can program computers to do visualization. And I'm sure somehow, you know, I'll be making movies one day. <laughs> yeah, so that was really the beginning. And when I got to school, um, there wasn't very much at the time. Most of the work in computer graphics at the time were in aerospace. And um, there were some work, you know, I, I obviously doing work in academia. And then people were starting to make commercials using computer graphics. When I got out of school, I applied and got a job at uh, Northrop. And, and a week before I was supposed to show up, I called them and I said, I can't do this. I, I said, I don't. I said, you know, I'm really sorry, but I can't take this job. And, and thought, I have to figure some other way to do this. You know, by hook or by crook, I ended up working for a Japanese ad agency. They were looking for a bilingual um, person that could help them because they were getting ready for Expo um, 85. And that was a big expo for Japan because these world expos are to show off, you know, industrial revolution um, from a technology standpoint. And all these Japanese technology companies were, you know, they were getting into the computer business and they all want to show that, you know, they were going to be the world leaders. And they all got bitten by this notion of you can show, visual, you, know, you can visualize using computers. So all these big Japanese companies, you know, want to sponsor American companies that were doing computer, computer graphics. You know, we weren't, it wasn't called computer animation at the point. It was still computer graphics. So um, because I knew what that meant, you know, I knew what computer gra uh, graphics was. I was bilingual. And here I was, you know, 24 years old. And so then to the ad agency thought, and this is this really interesting because this is a, this is a big agency and you know you have to be graduates of the very best university in Japan to work for this agency and women didn't work at the agency unless you were um, secretaries but because of the fact that I was you know raised here and I was bilingual and I had this I had this you know I had I had two degrees from Columbia University they were like smitten by me you know so I got in and having grown up here, even though we spoke Japanese at home and my parents were very traditional Japanese, you know, having gone to school here, even though I knew I was Japanese, I'm, I'm not Japanese in the way, um, the way I behave, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, they kind of took me and I think, you know, I had really great mentors there that really wanted me to su succeed. And because I had this passion dream of, you know, wanting to use computer graphics to animate and make movies. And the fact that, you know, I was a, you know, I was a good person that they could kind of sell to their clients, you know, that went, what, that wanted to do, spend a lot of money doing, you know, computer graphics for the expo. They kind of grew me into being an agency producer. I got to really get into the business without having to start at the bottom wow. because of just coincidence and just passion and just having the right things, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I got, you know, thrown in the deep water very quickly. And, um, you know, I had skills that in knowledge that they didn't have. So I got to learn from them and they got to learn from me and it was really great. And I spent the next, you know, next five years really doing that um 
And because I was doing computer graphics, they thought, well, you know, you could probably do things that are like visual effects. At the point, they weren't calling visual effects at the time, they were calling special effects. But anything to do that felt technical to them, that had, you know, technology and, and film associated, they were like, well, you know, you could do that. And I was like, yeah, I can do that, you know? And, I, and so it was a great, it, it was a really great learning experience. And I feel really, really grateful that, you know, that was given to me um, th and those opportunities came in and, and, and I, you know, just grabbed them as, as fast as they could come. Yeah, so, you know, that's how I got started in business. That's, that's quite, a, yeah. yeah, that's really, that's really quite amazing. Like the, the, just in general, the drive that you had throughout your life to, to, to pursue this and, um, you know, the skill sets that you picked up along the way that really propelled you into a, a place where it sounds like not a lot of other people, in particular women, um, had the same skill set. Um, it sounds like it really prepared you for um, the rest of your career. I mean, from there, what was it, what, what kind of, what were the next 10 years of your life like? Just yeah, that, that so fast. then after that, you know, I got out and, you know, one, and, and one of the board of directors, the dentist said, you know, you need to like go into your own business. And he hooked me up with, um, with the gentleman that ran a, a, a media conglomerate in Japan. And so I started a small production company for him in LA, did that for five years, realized I don't want to do that. Um, but at that point I had enough um, clients. So I kind of went into this consulting business and I, and, um, and, you know, kind of watched thinking, you know, somehow, some way I'm going to get into the computer animation business. And it was interesting because the opportunities would come along, but they were never the right opportunities, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then um, because I knew all the houses here in town that was doing computer graphics and, and by then it was turning its name to computer animation. I had a really good friend who was an agent, uh, who was a, a rep that rep a lot of the big companies. And she said, we got this big job. And the problem is she said, um, everybody at the company left and now we got to produce this job. Do you want to come and produce this job? And, and I was like, well, I've got I'm doing this, this Coca-Cola stop motion campaign for a white Kennedy for a good friend of mine. But I said, well, it's not going to take that long. So I said, well, why not? And it was a direct to DVD. Um, no, it was directed. It, it wasn't a DVD. It was direct to home video for Mortal Kombat. And the producers on Mortal Kombat had decided that they wanted to do a home video version off the first movie that was animated. So I showed up and, and they said, well, you're going to have a tough job here because they said, we've lost all our artists. We have the director left and you, and you got to produce this home video and deliver. <laughs> so that was like a crazy ride. But then um, uh, I think it was like the summer before that or two before that Roger Rabbit had released, you know? And so when I saw that, I was like, okay, clearly this is going to happen. And, you know, Disney at that time was doing um, rescues under and, 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 and their renaissance of, you know, their feature animation getting back into, into gear was starting to happen. So I thought it's got to happen. It's got to happen. Right. And then when I was doing that Mortal Kombat job, um, I heard that Warner Brothers was going to do Space Jam mm -hmm. and that a lot of the people that worked on Roger Rabbit were going to be working on it. And I was like, oh my God, there's got to be, a, a, there's got to be a job for me on that film. And so again, just by coincidence and circumstance and just sheer, sheer will, you know, I ended up on that film and I was their um, CG producer. No one knew what we, I mean, none of us knew what we were doing. <laughs> All we know was, okay, you know, we have this movie we got to do and it's, you know, um, Michael Jordan, playing basketball. We shot all this footage of him playing basketball on a green, green screen stage. We're going to make a CG basketball stadium. 
and Michael Jordan is going to play basketball with all these Looney Tune characters that are 2D animated. And somehow we have technology to put it all together. And so I went to work for Cinecite, uh, which was um, at the time owned by Eastman Kodak. And they were trying to figure out a way how to get themselves out of the film business into the, the digital world. And so they had invented a film recorder that basically recorded from digital to film. And they had put together uh, one of the first compositing uh, programs. And so the visual effects supervisor at, um, um, at Jones, who had worked on Roger Rabbit and had gone and had won the Oscar um, for um, his work in doing uh, Roger Rabbit using optical printers. He was now over at Cinecide making that switch into the digital world, you know. So we went over, so I, I, I got to be part of that team and we built the pipeline. Um, as soon as I had an office in Hollywood and an office in London, we worked seven days a week. We had two shifts going and animators all around the world animating. And, you know, we made this movie. Then by then, Disney was getting into wanting to get into the digital world. So then I got a call from a headhunter and saying, hey, I, I hear you're finishing Space Jam. We're building a digital studio. We're, we're making a movie called Dinosaur. Do you want to come over? And then they said, oh, you know, um, in fact, we have someone already here now. So, but, you know, the Florida studio is expanding and we're making a movie there. Do you want to go over there? And I was like, I really don't want to go to Florida. I really want to be part of this digital movie, you know, the digital studio. And luckily things again worked itself out where they said, oh, in fact, we have a slot for you now. And so that's how I ended up at Disney. Wow. I think what's amazing about your career is the um, amount of, you know, inter it's a very international career. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I wonder what, through your experiences, what you think how that relates to your role as a, women, as a woman. Um, just being female in an international community, do you face more challenges? Do you face less challenges? Um, I think Tonka House is such an international studio. Um, it is just an interesting in how it would relate to this studio. Yeah, you know, this is, this, this is I mean, this is kind of ironic, um, but also something that because the fact that I was an immigrant and I was always like, the, you know, my sister and I were always the two non-white kids in school that I think to a certain extent, I became oblivious to the fact that I was a woman and um, that I was a minority. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really 20, you know, the summer of 2013 when Women in Animation reached out to me where I realized, you know what, when I look around, there's so few of us and everybody else is a white man, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, there were times throughout my whole career where I was, you know, you know, when I think back, yes, I was discriminated, um, uh, in a sense of, you know, I didn't feel that I, I belonged, but I guess, you know, because I was always like, I want to do this and I want to do that, that I never, made myself feel like I was a victim and um, I just kept going regardless of what other people said and and I you know now you know now that I'm part of this movement I think back about those situations where yeah I did have recruiters who said you know you're a woman for this position and we don't typically hire a woman for this position <laughs> and but it was like why are you telling me this you know and it's like but I, I never took it personal, you know, and I was like, that's an odd statement for you to make. And you're a woman telling me this to another woman. But I guess I, I'm, I'm fortunate because I, that, that those things didn't stop me. And when I talk to so many people today where they are, you know, affected by it, I go, okay, we've got to change the way we think because it wasn't the fact that I was just a minority, you know, it's that majority feel that way, you know? So um, that's why, you know, I'm really, 
but that's why I'm really um, inspired every day to go, what can we do as women to make this a better place for women who want to be in this business? You know, what are the things that we need to do so that, so that they feel like they belong and they feel like they can make a difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely. Um, our, we've, Tongue House is lucky enough to have quite a few um, very, very talented and young women. And the comment that has come up is that we edit ourselves. Um, and I just think that hearing your story is so incredible because it is somebody who's just not really letting it deter them, you know, letting these comments that the recruiter's making or that, you know, looking around and you're not, look, you don't look like everybody else in your position and just that that doesn't really, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything and that doesn't, I mean, it's it's just it's it's truly inspirational, and I think that for whatever reason made you that way. It's um, yeah, I think that it's something that we can all learn from too. Yeah, and and I really credit my parents, especially my dad, um, because as my mother said, um, she that my dad always wanted girls, and but he didn't treat us treat us like little girls in the sense of girls should just get married, you know, and, and, um, and, and, you know, make a good wife, you know, um, he, he wanted us to have careers and, um, you know, my sister ended up being a lawyer and, um, you know, she ended up raising three kids. I'm, I don't have any kids and she wanted that, you know, so I credit my parents and, and this is why, this is what I tell uh, a lot of fathers when, you know, men come to me and go, I have a girl that want to be in animation. What do you think? And I go, you got to let her, you got to let her uh, live her dream. You know, mm -hmm. you got to give her every opportunity to live her dream. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think fathers are very protective of, of their children, especially girls. And they're concerned that, you know, this is a business that, you know, isn't a real business. And I go, look around you, animations everywhere. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. It's not just on the big screen and on the TV screen. It's everywhere. So if your girl has that dream, you've got to let them, you know, you got to let them live that dream. And then we have to pay the way so that, so that, you know, that they feel safe and they feel that they can succeed. That's a, that's a big, that's a big chart, a big job for all of us. And I think we need to do that. And, and because, you know, I think, I think, I think we're put here for a reason. You know, I, I do believe that we're, as, a, as people, we're here for a reason. And um, you get to a certain point in your life where you go, okay, you got to do, you know, everything you d dreamt about. <laughs> and now it's time to, you know, give something back so that the next generation of people can do what I got to do. Mm -hmm. that's amazing so yeah so i'm real, you know i i want i want house you know, i want places like tunko house to succeed because i so much believe in what dies and robert and zen and all of you guys have put together to tell the stories you guys want to tell and to be the kind of you know um a production company that repre represents that you know not just what's on the screen but to make what's on that screen those how those, those are the people that can make that difference, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in general, you know, Courtney and I have been both talking a lot about, um, you know, especially within your initiative, how uh, there are a number of small studios that are part of it uh, for the initiative with women in animation. Um, and within that, like, that seems even though they're small, they're, there's great change in that. And not only... Um, for the women in those companies, in particular at Tonko House, and the roles that they can take on, the challenges, you know, and as a small studio of startups, um, you know, there's always more and more to take on and uh, more hats to wear, more to learn, <laughs> uh, which is great uh, and can be overwhelming and, and remarkable. But at the same time, when, in getting to fill those spaces and, and tell their, our own stories, I feel like 
there's also a, the in animation hopefully um, a greater push towards not only representation in um, in the studios but also on screen yeah you know and and I would be curious to get your your take on the if you feel like there's a change in tides of um, how women and and female characters are being portrayed on actually on screen well i think on screen we have a long ways to go yeah. we have a long long ways to go and i love what gina davis said uh which you know she, what she puts out there she says you know take all the on screen characters and make make half of them to be women mm-hmm. i think that's the first step and i'm great that i'm really really great that um she's doing that that's you know she's out there saying everyone to everyone do that because I think a lot of men are afraid, or a lot of people, not just, just men, but um, a lot of people are afraid that they're gonna have the wrong female character. So when Gina says, take half of them, make them, make them gals, then you can have all kinds of characters, right? But I think that's one step, but I think the next step is you've gotta get female um, creators because then they can tell stories and they can, tell sto- and they can create characters they're really meaningful, not just, you know, guys and girls, you know, and, and girls that look like, like girls, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, there are all kinds of people. And um, I, I love the fact that, you know, when Gina says that, you know, she's saying people are people regardless of, um, regardless of gender. But I think if we want to do more than that, we have to get women creators behind it because they can really create characters and tell stories that only women can do that. And it's, it comes true with, you know, with people of color, right? Mm-hmm. You, you need, you need African-American um, creators if you want to tell stories about them. Like you need Japanese people telling stories about, you know, Japan or, or people that know the Japanese culture tell stories about Japan. You can't have some guy from, you know, Wisconsin tell stories about Japan because, I mean, I think to be a good storyteller, you have to have that personal experience. And if you don't have that personal experience, how can you create characters or stories that you can connect to? I think it's going to happen because I think, you know, I think we've been really fortunate with the whole Time's Up and the Me Too campaign that's happened over the last, you know, 12 months. I think people in Hollywood are now facing the facts that they've got to do something about it and, and they, can't, they can't hide now. I think the um, whole movement is happening and i think it's it and i and i'm hopeful that it's really going to happen because now everyone's paying attention that's great but we got to do the work right yeah, because absolutely. just because it's topical doesn't mean it happens i mean we have to all get behind and do the work so um you know right now i'm producing the lego sequel movie for warner brothers and you know it was really important to get a female co-director on the movie because the story we're telling is a brother sister relationship story. And um, in order to tell that story successful, I felt that we needed a female co-director. I wanted a female story artist and, and the director and um, the co-director believed in that. And so over half of our story department are girls. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I'm, it's really heartening too. you know, I think, as you say, the, I, I love all the things they're doing with women in animation, but when it comes down to it, too, what are we doing to mm-hmm. to to provide those opportunities, those stepping mm-hmm. stones? So actively using your your position as a producer and your influence over how a production is run and how the people who make it, um, giving that space and and in particular looking at the value that of what those women filmmakers are bringing to that and really support that story, I think is very, very smart and uh, remarkable. Um, I certainly hope that there's, there are more producers, both men and women and directors for that matter, looking to emulate what you're doing. I think it will happen because whether by choice or, um, or not, I think because the movement is such a strong movement mm-hmm. to create equality, hopefully, you know, that, you know, it's easy to kind of fall back and go, you know, let's just do it. Let's just do it the way we're used to doing. Let's just hire the people we know. 
but if you take a if if you say okay no we have to we have to make this change you can make the change there are a lot of girls storyboarding tv that's where our female story artists are coming from and given the days where movies have to get made so quickly these days mm -hmm. i'm telling you story artists that come out of tv are really well disciplined to do this because they're nimble they're fast they're flexible and so you combine them with senior talent that come from features you know those guys are learning something from the tv guys and tv guys are learning something from the feature guys and and it's great because now we're creating that that momentum and that and meeting the challenge of how to get these movies made faster so it's a win-win and it's great because everyone wins at the end and and by doing that making that big cultural shift and social shift of getting quality of um of the gender is super important i want to make sure it happens on the um on the race front as well as well as people of um you know sexual preferences um people of handicap i mean we really need to see better equality mm -hmm, absolutely and animation is a is, is is a really a good you know place for that to happen because we have these you know especially in features where we have these long schedules where you know yes we're you know you know i know there's a, a push that comes at the end where we're working crazy hours it's a pretty steady um you know industry and you can be in one place you don't have to travel and um go on location you know you can work at a studio have a nine to six job yes there are you know days and weeks and months where people are working six day weeks and they're working 12 12 hour days and 14 hour days but i think it's it's, a, it's still much more you know con conducive to you know being able to have a family family and raise kids and all that yeah yeah so i mean i mean what what are the things um that tonko house is um striving to do in terms of storytelling i mean i think that having more authentic characters regardless of gender or i mean right now you know for dam keeper all our characters are animals so race is, <laughs> <laughs> race is not as obvious but i think that um just like you said that it's inclusive to all types of people and that the characters are authentic and um, like you know what you were saying people are people um, and just um, in terms of yeah and storytelling and just making sure that all our stories it's the huge goal that they come from a really really personal place um, mm -hmm. and so it is our hopes to get a really diverse creative team because we demand the stories to come from that those personal experiences and so in order to tell those authentic stories and have a diverse group of characters then we do need to have a diverse creative and within team. that yeah sorry um i think you know the filmmakers we are working with at tonko house recognize, you know, instead of necessarily having the approach of like, okay, now we need more uh, women balance within our series or within our shows. It's more like from the very, the early development, recognizing that those are stories. You know, uh, some of the series that we're developing right now, you know, you have various moments where it's, those are stories that they're coming in with saying, I, I want to tell the story of this mother and, mm -hmm. um, or I, I, this individual. And, and, and it's always, that's where it's coming from the ver that very that very um, seed uh, in storytelling, mm -hmm. which I think is is what we is really remarkable at Tonko House and uh, really important and certainly uh, has great value for me. You know, obviously in the products that we're trying to make, the films, the stories, but also just in the day to day and you know when I go home to my own daughter, mm -hmm. um, knowing that these are, are things that hopefully will have greater influence for her someday, and yeah. when she's looking at the value of her own stories. Yeah, and I love it because what you guys do is you're using animals. And one of the things that I think kids miss today is that level of imagination because we're so, everybody's so glued on to, you know, reality TV and video games and all those things. And you kind of lose a sense of imagination. But what I love about the work you guys do is you put it in these amazing designed animals that 
little kids and adults we all love, right? Yeah. And but you put values and characters into these um, characters that really transform itself, transcends itself, where you're telling really personal stories, but you're doing it in an animal form. So it's like the work that you guys do is where my heart has always been as a child, uh, you know, going back to that lady and tramp. Yeah. Yeah. There's something, there's something about it that I think that makes it also universal. That's great. Yeah. And I think as a small studio, what's such a gift and um, just where we are at a studio is it doesn't, the roles are not quite as defined as at a larger studio. And so what you were saying earlier about a lot of product, you know, Megan and I are both producers and the production staff is all women. And um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have a voice in the creative. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that's, that's important is, you know, getting, using all the resources that you can in a studio and not just pigeon, uh, pigeon, pigeon holding somebody to just what their title is. Um, yeah. Because, you know, we're all here because we love it and we mm -hmm. love storytelling <laughs> and we all, you know, did this job that we thought was impossible, but we made it a career and um, yeah. Well, Jinko-san, it is such an incredible pleasure and honor to speak with you. Yeah, thank you for... No, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's just, I get so excited when you, you know, when we talk about what we're trying to accomplish at Women in Animation, because like I said, you know, I was oblivious to all this. And, and now that it's so clear to me, you know, that if we're not out there trying to make this change, that it's really difficult for that change to happen. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you for um, making the time to have me on your podcast. I'm really, really honored. No, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs>